Good evening. It is the 9th of August, 2023. I'm in Minsk, as usual. I have to get out a little bit more, don't I? Yes. <laughs> and news. The news lately. A lot of crazy stuff, like it always is. You know. But uh, I'll say the best. Well, at least the most interesting, not the best. By no means best. But anyway, the most interesting news, probably the most potential for having some kind of a great effect on what's happening in the world today, is Victoria Newland's visit to Niger a few days ago. Was it the day before yesterday or whatever, just recently. But you know her, the midwife of coup d'etats. But this time it's a little bit different. It's actually the, the role is resist, reversed. Excuse me, not resisted. The role is reversed. There is already a coup d'etat that has occurred. And um, this coup d'etat was apparently to be throwing out Western-backed governments. And she was sent, I guess, to reverse a coup d'etat? That's very strange. Instead of midwifing one, which is the usual, so Larry Johnson, the CIA analyst, who actually, I guess during his time when he was active in the CIA as an analyst, of course, he was active in Africa very much of the time. So he probably understands this quite a bit. And uh, so many people rely on Larry Johnson's uh, um, analysis. So I guess he kind of knows how things work very well. And he said, and I guess I can't argue with that, is that her mission was to go there, basically, and to threaten Niger, <laughs> this new government, which seems to be, seems to be a, popular, a popular government, the new one, the coup, the coup government. She, told, she was there probably to threaten them and tell them to stand down and to reinstate uh, the other head of state. By the way, a lot of these coup d'etats that you hear about, normally they uh, accompany violence. This one did not come with any violence. And there's no threat to the life of the former leader. He's on house arrest. And apparently they've even allowed him, at least at times, to send messages. He sent a message to the United States, probably to, I think it was, uh, in his message, he was asking for the United States to intervene militarily. In other words, to shed blood. <laughs> and uh, Russia's trying to stay out of this at all and say that this has to be handled by negotiation. And then you have other countries, uh, such as Nigeria, which is to the north. Or is it to the north or to the south? To the north. <laughs> no, I don't even know. I, I'm not... Uh, 100% on my estimates of Russian uh, uh, geography. But anyway, Niger seems to be split. They have people there that, uh, that want to intervene militarily, and then those that say, we are not going to intervene militarily. So that's kind of, a, that's kind of up for grabs there. But there's a, a lot of these other countries in the, uh, what do they call it, the ECOS, the, uh, uh, economic community of of Western African states, ECOWAS or whatever they call that. In any case, they have an economic union there, which seems to also, it's sort of like maybe the European Union was supposed to be a, <laughs> for certain other purposes, but now it's a, it's a one size fits all for all policies for everybody sort of a place. Black cat. I love black cats. Kitty. Hey, what you doing over there? <laughs> He's probably busy looking at, at something. He's hunting. She. I think it's a she. I tell you, I don't know. I can't tell a female cat from a male. Pretty cat. Love black cats. Especially black cats. But anyway. I'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, about Ni Niger, 
in a minute here, but uh, a lot of this stuff is just sounding like, like I said in my last video, there's wars in the air, and this might be another there's a noisy car here. This might be a potential big hostility. Jackson Hinkle had also mentioned that uh, Wagner, the private military corporation of Wagner, had answered the call to Niger and, uh, and was on their way to offer assistance, at least set up an office in Niger, Niger. And apparently, I believe they were coming from Mali, and <laughs> at least I think what he, the information that he got, normally he's very accurate, like Jackson Hinkle, but uh, nobody else has really been mentioning this. So he, he, he's actually quite amazing. It's, I, I, I'm not going to dismiss it just because I haven't heard anything from anybody else, but he was saying that uh, uh, the Taurigs, apparently stopped them or are blocking Wagner from entering Niger. So take it for what it's worth. Whenever you hear about these, uh, these terrorist groups, I tell you, most of these are controlled by a big, powerful Western government. One government. Sounds like the ring, one ring to bind them all. So, whenever you hear about these sort of things, whenever it turns out to be, sometimes, it's, it's sort of like, I don't know, going into this sort of thing, talking about what was going on in Syria all that time, and you hear about these different so-called terrorist groups and good terrorists that smile when they kill you and things like that, I don't know. And it's even still going on today. They have these groups in Syria. And just like it was in Afghanistan, and you find out at some point in time that these are not just uh, uh, spontaneous groups that, that come up, <laughs> that there is actually a greater power that pays them and controls them. Because you always have to ask, well, where do they get their money? How do they, how do they, <laughs> how do they, sustain their existence. Say no more, say no more. In the last video I was also mentioning, you know, a lot of this is stuff, um, you know, it's not just uh, this Niger coup, but you see there's a lot of build up here now in Belarus. I mean, outside of Belarus, right on the borders here. And I mentioned yesterday, or not yesterday, the, the last video that I had made, that we have uh, um, reports of major troops and equipment amassing on the border of Belarus um, on the side of Latvia up in the northern parts. And just uh, today, not very long ago, uh, Sergei Shoigu, he was mentioning uh, NATO has stationed now roughly, you know, give or take a thousand or so, uh, they have stationed 360,000 troops on the border of Belarus. And this is, you know, a much shorter border than when uh, the special military operation started and Russia came with, I believe, altogether 200,000, which means a lot of support troops as well in the back. So the force right now that's on the border of Belarus is 360,000. That's on the border of Belarus, and that does not include the border of Ukraine, how many troops that Poland has down there, or NATO, NATO in general. So the United States, as you know, has a lot of troops on that side. That is the uh, hub of the operations of what goes on in Ukraine, because they uh, apparently they'd have no fear of getting bombed by Russia, you know, based on the protection that Article 5 of NATO gives them gives NATO, but they won't get bombed. Because attack on one is, a, is an attack on all. You know, that sort of a thing. And it's, uh, you know, that's why you see, that's why you see these uh, so-called Chihuahua states uh, 
you know, like the little dogs when you go to visit somebody and you say, what's, what's, that, what's that down there? Then you see some little dog pulling on your pant leg, uh, you know, like a, it's a chihuahua. And those are uh, these Baltic states, uh, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania. <laughs> so they're pretty big and powerful when they got, uh, when they got the United States and other collective militaries backing them up. <laughs> Just think if they were left to, to, to fend for themselves, they would have to make friends with Belarus. So, and Belarus does not threaten anybody militarily. So that's, what's, uh, that's what the big kicker is here. Belarus had a very small military actually, and uh, it's, they, they haven't really expanded it that much, I don't think, since that time. Uh, compared to Poland, Poland has, uh, has mobilized troops. So there is, in other words, there's a draft in Poland. So that's wh how they're expanding the size of their military. I don't even know what, what that encompasses, what ages and what, what are the status of these people that have to go into military service are. But in other words, these are conscripts, you know, and if they're going to start some kind of a war with conscripts, not pro professional soldiers, you know, they were looking at Russia and they were accusing them of using conscripts as so like that's a big uh, crime. You know, conscripts are supposed to be sort of like observing at some point and not taking part in any real life-threatening hostilities. As you know, that that's, that's really never the case. They also do take part. So Vietnam or anything else, you can talk about that. Uh, with the announcement of this 360,000 troops, and uh, he also said 8,000 armored vehicles. So I, I'm wondering, is this the biggest buildup that they have had? You know, the, constantly, I, I remember even before I was living in Belarus, the U.S. and uh, n collective NATO countries had always been uh, amassing lots of troops and things on the border, always building more and more over the period of time. And uh, I doubt very much that they're going to invade. So <laughs> even though they've been threatening this for quite some time, um, as you know, Belarus now has tactical nuclear uh, weapons in its territory, and uh, Lukashenko doesn't look very worried. So, you know, all these hostilities, and he was actually a lot more nervous in the past years with threats, you know, and I don't know. It's just, it's just not as bad as it was back in the past, and I think he's telling everybody really not to worry. He doesn't look really worried, so if he's not worried, I'm not that worried. So, and you just, but you just don't know. You just don't know. There, there's, there's a lot of these crazy people over there in the West. Look at the crazy things they do. The provocation, the provocation alone, what they did with Russia, to provoke Russia into this uh, so-called attack or whatever on uh, the Western borders there of, of the Donbass. You know, that was a provocation. It makes you wonder, why, why did they do that? constantly for all these years they were bombing the Donbass how many thousands of people did they kill civilians innocent people the Ukraine and they even they even brag about it you remember Poroshenko saying that he's gonna all the kids of the Western Ukraine they're all gonna be going to school and to college during all that time the children of the Donbass are gonna be cowering and hiding in their basements and not going to school because they'll be frightened from the bombs that uh, Ukraine is dropping on them. <laughs> well, the collective West does not put that in the news, apparently, for the people of the consumption of the people of the West. I'll let you know how dastardly <laughs> your own side is, I guess you should say. I, I don't want to say your side because uh, if you knew that what the leadership of the Western countries are doing, you, you wouldn't want any part of that. So, but don't also, also don't forget that the elements of the, uh, you know, connected to the Polish government, they've been threatening a coup d'etat in, uh, in Belarus. Violent, a violent coup d'etat, military overthrow of the government of Belarus. And as you know, they were, uh, I think, what was, I'm trying to, I keep losing track. It was a, a, not this past year, but the May Day before that, there was an attempted assassination of, uh, of uh, Lukashenko. They wanted to kill Lukashenko and his entire family. Really, these people are, you see, it sounds very desperate to me. So that's the only reason why 
you might have some concern. Um, like I said, Lukashenko isn't that worried, but you might want to be concerned because I think these people, they're not, uh, they're not rational. There's some, I don't know if you would call it insanity or just, uh, or stupidity or just, just total irrational thinking. <laughs> By the way, I think this today, I think that is the anniversary of, uh, Saakashvili's attack on South Ossetia with the approval of the United States. And I believed, believe it or not, to a certain extent, Israel was even involved a little bit with that. But obviously the United States was doing that. Und under the cover of the Olympics, remember it was uh, uh, the, a lot of the heads of state were, I think it was in China. And during that time, Saakashvili made his attack, killed the Russian peacekeepers, and were going through the one of the cities of South Ossetia, a major city that's right there on the border, right across the border there, and throwing grenades into the houses. Actually, what they were doing is machine gunning through the windows and the doors on the sides of the houses, and, uh, and uh, after everybody would be going into their basement to try to get away from the hail of bullets, uh, they would throw grenades in the in the basements, and I think I think in one day they killed. There was it. I don't know. I, th I think the entire the entire rescue operation from Russia. I think that lasted maybe five days. But of course, Russia did not respond for three days. Um, I think the fighting was going on for three days, and I think in that time they had killed. If I if I remember properly over 3,000 civilians, not military, over 3,000 civilians that identify themselves as being Russian, not Georgian. Makes you sort of wonder, you know, why would these people in the Donbass, or why would these people in South Ossetia want to be part of a government that places so little value on their life and they, and they, they kill them, they wantonly kill them or bomb them, like in the case of the Donbass in Ukraine. And then they, the Ukraine acts like they want to recover that territory. But as, as you've been seeing in the past, let's say, year, as um, things go on more and more, you're finding out that the main goal, like I've always said from the very beginning, is the Crimea. Because the Crimea, in my opinion, this is my theory, that's the payback. The Crimea is the payback for the United States for the militarization, all of the weapons and the training that's turned out to be somewhat useless apparently. And the weapons didn't turn out to be uh, the cat's meow either, wonder weapons. So I think the payment is for the United States to have control of the Crimea because that has been a dream of the United States for a long, long time. Many, that's maybe for many people's lifetimes. At least uh, I remember that from the 80s. I keep saying that in every video and I, I should keep stressing that because uh, now it's been proven. I've been, I've been saying that. I, I don't know why other vloggers have not been saying that. I don't know why. I really don't. Some of them are, were in the military in my time, and they must have heard this too. I'd heard it from generals. I've heard it from, uh, I guess, uh, strategists, military strategists. I, I was stationed at the U.S. Army headquarters in, uh, in Heidelberg, Germany, and I maybe that's the reason why I heard that because I was uh, around for some uh, with some of these uh, some of these generals that uh, are in command, and I heard it personally from them. I had a job where I was in contact with a lot of like heads of state sometimes, not a lot, but some of them. Some you know most of the time I didn't really come into contact with them, even though I was working for them at the time, and high military, high-ranking military people from as a matter of fact various nations. As a matter of fact, one time. Russian. And we, it was, this is during the Cold War, by the way, still, but uh, I don't even know who, but anyway, some um, highest ranking general of Russia or of the area, or at least of the, in command of whatever Russian forces, which were in station in East Germany, possibly anyway. I don't know. I don't know exactly who it was. I wasn't really paying attention so much, but I know they came there and, uh, you know, being a U.S. soldier and Unfortunately, I guess, I don't know if you'd say an indoctrinated or brainwashed and, you know, chomping at the bit, oh, uh, 
in a like a bulldog waiting to break break off of its leash or something I'm not saying I was extreme like that but anyway that's how they make you feel that's what that's how we are supposed to feel while we were in the US military at that time in the in the 80s during the Cold War I can tell you other times when I was in a, a terrorist um, anti-terror <laughs> an anti-terrorist uh, training camp and then we had um, at that time it was um, some people also getting trained this was a um, tr uh, training conducted uh, by um, uh, the Germans so this was not US military training uh, it was uh, anti-terrorist training conducted by uh, uh, highly trained German people and I was in one class and uh, strangely enough the overlapping class that came after us was the uh, <clears throat> were uh, <laughs> um, people from Iran <laughs> And uh, one of the people in my, in my group was uh, as a Navy SEAL, and uh, and he was he was actually chopping up a bit. So uh, that's I'm just adding that as a side note. So getting off on tangents, you know, it's my channel. I can get off on these tangents, and I hope a lot of you don't mind if I do that. Just uh, rehashing, uh, you know, it helps me with my memory, remembering some of these old things from the old past. One of the more frightening things, you know, you talk about these people and they're doing these crazy things, you know, like even from Poland. And you've already seen how it works in Ukraine. These people that are in charge, this, these people that are, that are very heavily infected with this ideology, they have no qualms about sending their own people and to use them as human minesweepers. <laughs> you know, using equipment is too expensive, so they're sending bodies. They, uh, maybe they're finding the least desirable ones, maybe the ones that that are Russian blooded or whatever. I know that a lot of these people are coming from uh, the area of Odessa and maybe the Transcarpatia area, which uh, is more associated with Hungary. And maybe even other people that maybe they seem to feel have uh, sympathies towards Russia. They're, they're the ones that they're sending through the minefields. And if they capture Russian soldiers, they send them through the minefields as well to try to detonate these mines in order to get closer to the first line of defense uh, of Russia, which I, as far as I've known or I've been hearing, they, ha they haven't really reached that far yet. And oddly enough, I believe this is known because I believe one Russian soldier that was a, a captive, they sent him through the minefield and somehow uh, he got to a certain point where he could alert his own Russian uh, um, comrades on the other side and they, um, they led him through because he had at his back um, his Ukrainian captives that were telling him that if uh, if he doesn't keep going that they're going to shoot him shoot him in the back so luckily he he was able to get through I don't know if any of you have seen that kind of footage uh, I get a lot more footage over here maybe because uh, obviously I'm a little bit closer to these hostilities here but some things are just really horrific there are channels I'm not a subscriber to these channels but I've seen I've seen some of the things you know, some of these Bradley fighting vehicles, for example, driving over a Russian mine. And I don't even know, I don't even know how this person who was filming this, um, what, what their state of mind was, but they show the doors opening up and these Ukrainian soldiers coming out with the half of their legs blown off, you know, and just breathing in pain on the ground. And, and then their comrades coming out injured, but maybe not as badly injured, and they're and they're barely able to even stand on their feet and, and they can't even help their compatriots. Obviously, these people are in a state of shock. I don't know about the person that is filming it. I, I, you know, having a camera in my hand right now, and I, I don't know, to me, if I see some event happening, you know, I, it's, it doesn't enter my mind to take out a camera. I, I really don't know. I don't know if I, you know, if you should be against people that film these things or if you should uh, have any kind of a, thanks for them I don't know for documenting such things because I, I don't know I don't know what I could do I, I would feel more like I would have to help the person here that's in pain D during that video what I saw the uh, the soldier himself that had lost like obviously both feet and parts of his shin everything below that of course was gone halfway down his shins his feet and his shins were gone and he was taking off a 
his belt, I guess, to use, use as a tourniquet, and he was applying the tourniquet way up high here. Um, in first aid in the U.S. Army, we didn't learn to do it that way, but I'm just, uh, I'm just again, going off on a tangent, uh, telling you what I saw. And another thing, well, first let me finish what I was saying there. When you talk about maybe Poland doing something irrational like that, I don't think they're going to have any qualms about sending their people to even what is nearly certain death. Terrible. It makes you wonder when the Ukrainians are going to more unite. I, I really don't know. They have this ideology over there, I'm telling you. I don't live there. I'm not in their shoes and I'm not in their place, so I don't know what, what, uh, what they can do about all that. But um, some of the other disturbing news you're hearing is that there's a huge portion of the Ukrainian male population is gone. This is going to be a lost generation, obviously, in Ukraine. A lot of the people uh, that have fled, fled over the borders to Russia, to Belarus, to Hungary and to Poland. They don't plan on coming back, apparently. Let's you know about what they think of their government over there. But then there's a major portion of them have lost their lives. Uh, cannon fodder, cannon fodder, made to serve these, this, these people that are infected with this ideology. And that's what it's all about, people. It's not about defending your country. Just think what would happen if, if they just gave up. Ukraine would just go on as it always has. The only reason that this is going on is, uh, one is their massacre of the people in the Donbass, which they see as subhumans, because they are more related to Russian, and the Ukrainians are very close to Russian anyway. Belarusians are very close. This is northern Slavic people, so. Poland's, Polish people are even somewhat close. But anyway, these people believe they're part of the master race. That's part of this ideology, so we'll talk more about that at different times here. You know, there's a lot of people running around here watching me, so I <laughs> feel like I'm on a stage. If I was given some presentation and they could understand me, maybe I'd, maybe I'd be a little bit less uh, camera shy, I guess. But um, anyway, a lot of what Ukraine is saying now, there's a lot of people that's putting out that since... Uh, uh, so many people have perished that what they are planning on doing is um, after the conflict is over, as a matter of fact, even right now, they're not allowing any young men, I believe under the age of 50, to, to cross the borders out of Ukraine. And uh, they are believing that they're going to win this conflict. And immediately after this conflict, for a period of three years, young men will not be able to leave Ukraine. That is what their projection is, but um, I'll tell you what, in truth, they're not going to win this conflict. And I don't know where they get their confidence when they know fully well that they're not going to win this conflict. They're not winning it yet. Tell me, how much success have they had for recovering these new territories, or at least the, these lost territories, lost territories to Russia? How many times have they said they're going to be sitting on the beaches in the Crimea? I think they've said that twice. They haven't gotten one inch closer. Not one inch. Not one inch closer to the Crimea. Hmm. What about their military uh, equipment production? What about their soldiers? What about their personnel? Practically, practically all dried up. So how do they think they're going to win this conflict? They're obviously not. I don't know. I, I, I always, I'm always perplexed by people that cannot, cannot face reality. It has nothing to do with hope. There's a big difference. To have hope, you have to have a chance, but uh, it's much different to face reality when you have no chance. Hmm. I didn't say that very well. I'm sure there's a, a lot better ways to say this, but I'll... You all know what I'm getting at. Where are all these people at? They're all over the place. They're sitting in cars and I guess, I don't know. Hmm. 
But in case of this threat coming over the border, that's some note that I didn't, uh, I didn't mention here talking about this, uh, this other thing. Why is it that everywhere I'm going there's, there's people sitting or walking or whatever? But what I was going to say about this threat, I would tell the Belarusian people to uh, not forget your partisan past if these people do cross the border, just like they did in the past, the same types of people with that same ideology. <laughs> and they are, they do have the same ideology, the same ideology as those that crossed your border on June 22nd, 1941. And don't forget what you stand for. So that's just my message at this time for the Belarusians. Um, they have no qualms about sending masses of their people uh, through minefields for to be liquidated under tactical nukes. <laughs> Not smiling at that, I'm smiling at the lady there. They have no qualms about sending masses of their own people when they know very well what would be awaiting them if they crossed into the Belarusian borders. And again, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's going to happen, to be honest with you. I, I uh, <laughs> have more trust in the opinion of, uh, of Lukashenko than I do by looking at the scare tactics from these jokers over there on the western border, amassing their little troops and things like that. And I hope I have the, well, in case that ever does happen, I hope I have, uh, I have some faith in the Belarusian people to be ready for something like that, so. Well, I guess you're gathering now that I am concerned. <laughs> But in my case, unlike the case of this leadership of Ukraine, I do have hope. I do have hope that, uh, that everything's going to be okay here. It's not going to be the case for this ideology. Some people playing soccer there. You might want to see that. The future team of Belarus. Look at that. There, some of them are having long hair. <laughs> yes. Maybe they've seen me. Maybe I'm a trendsetter. I'm kidding. Alensky's top advisor, Podolyak. <laughs> he came out. I don't know how these people keep putting their foot in their mouth, but... Uh, he came out and he said that uh, when the conflict is over, you know, believing that they're going to win, of course, that um, in a sense, I don't know, let me, let me first tell you what he basically said. What he was saying that they're going to compete against Poland after the conflict is over. And that's, that's putting it mildly. He said they're going to be competitors after that. In other words, you know, they're the ones that are mainly responsible the United States, of course, providing all these weapons, and then Poland uh, being uh, of the most help to them, besides the United States, in this conflict, and sending a lot of their people over there, a lot of mercenaries of Poland have also died, and they're going to thank them by, by competing against them, economically and who knows what, maybe for territory, for everything. In other words, it like, sounds like a stab in the back if you talk, if you ask me, you know, not, not being grateful. Look at, uh, look at how this relationship is here now with uh, um, Belarus and Russia. And um, Belarus is not really that involved, just, just slightly involved in this conflict in Ukraine. And yet they're very grateful to Russia for assisting them and you know during the conflict Russia is grateful to Belarus it's a mutual it's a mutual friendship and then look at look at Ukraine they depend very much on Poland and then they're saying that they're basically going to work against them after the conflict is over well they're not going to win anyway but 
I think, uh, who knows? Who knows who Poland is actually going to be dealing with at that time? It might be Russia. I don't know. I'll tell you what. At this time, you know, like a lot of people have been talking, um, I feel, and I think a lot of Russians feel, and I think Dmitry Medvedev, the former president, and uh, I believe he's, uh, his title is uh, the uh, chairman of, uh, oh gosh, I even forgot. Anyway, he's, in, he's, he's very much involved in the Department of Defense in, in Russia and, uh, you know, equipment and all that and overseeing that sort of thing. And, uh, but uh, if Russia does not go all the way to Odessa, you know, that's just going to, that's just going to be a recipe or a prerequisite for future conflicts because uh, unless they go to Kiev, if they go to Kiev, then they don't have to go to, to Odessa. I mean, that's kind of a trick, isn't, isn't there? I don't know. I don't know what Russia's plan is. I, I don't think they had any sort of a plan to, to take over Ukraine. I think, that first, of course, the big plan was just to stop this uh, persecution of the people in the Donbass and to get security guarantees and not have Ukraine go into NATO. But um, if that's morphed into something else, I don't know about this denazification, that's, that's actually impossible. They can go all the way to the border of Poland and they're not going to denazify them. There's going to be Nazis there all the time. There's, uh, they're, you know, they're going to have partisan Nazis. These people that, that pride themselves on believing they're somehow racially superior. It's, it's, it's incredible. You know, you thought humanity was actually gone a lot, a lot further than that now, but I guess, I guess, I guess not. So, and how is that, how are these, these racially superior people supposed to fit in with this woke leftist agenda, agenda of diversification and uh, inclusion and all that that's coming from their partners? Well, I'll tell you what, it's not going to fit in. You know, I think both of them look at each other as, uh, you know, you see you have these neo-nasties and they are using, they believe they're using the West as their uh, useful idiots. And uh, at the same time, you have the, the leadership of the West believing that they're using the neo-nasties as their useful idiots. So <laughs> just think if this, if this one if this thing ended in their victory, in the victory of, of, uh, of the neo-nasties, the neo-libs, and the neo-cons, this would be incredible, because they'd all be killing each other then. That would be the endless, endless war. So the only, the only way to really end this is for Russia to liberate Ukraine, liberate probably the entirety of Ukraine, because I don't think these people are ever going to, they're ever going to rest, you know. They delight in their hatred. So, no more to say about that. But anyway, Podolyak, do you know what? Uh, do you know what ideology is in his head? You, you you can hear it all the time. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, Nigeria. I was uh, or Niger, Niger, not Nigeria. The whole thing, and again, without really looking at a map and seeing how, because you know you're, you're actually better off looking at a map, and you can find out when when uh, if if anything really does come about. That's when you really need to look at a map because you're, you're going to find out who is going to be moving forces from which place to another place and you, everybody's going to be jockeying on who's on what side and uh, if this sort of thing really does kick off. And uh, I am now a lot more on the side of Niger, the coup government, after finding out a lot more. I, I was kind of leaning a little bit that way anyway because, you know, when you find out that, uh, that the... Uh, either the collective West or at least some of the Western countries, such as in this case France and the United States, heavily, heavily involved in the exploitation of, uh, of Niger. So, you know, both of them have troops there. They still have to this very day. I think the United States had a, it sounded like a battalion or something like a very large battalion. I think it was 1,500 1, or was that the French that had 1,500 soldiers in Niger? But as it is right now, there's, uh, uh, there is no, uh, how do you say that, uh, hostilities going on right there. But the collective West and their buddies are going to make sure that there will be, <laughs> unless they get their way, apparently. 
So let's just see how badly the United States really wants to, really wants to take Niger or France or both. You know, one of them will be uh, propping up the other. And when you see some of these West African states, you know, some of them are pretty formidable, actually. And if they all kind of get together, which is something I would fear, and they, it's sort of like, like, like creating their temporary little, like a little NATO or something, all that. They all band together and go after this state. And I don't know about uh, Wagner even taking part in that. You know, Wagner, at least over here in, uh, in Europe, they were... Uh, basically uh, declawed you know they took away a lot of the um, the weaponry of Wagner so at least all the heavy weaponry I don't know what they have now just a bunch of guns or something they're not gonna get too far without artillery so Larry Johnson again yeah he's saying that that's mostly for uranium that they um, that the US wants that and you talk about uh, you know there's uranium in other places I believe Canada has uranium of course Russia has uranium and uh, not a much, much of a chance of them getting uh, getting that or getting a, a great deal on it. I don't know. Half the way what they do to Russia. But um, if you hear about the price, I think they were getting what they were giving to, to Niger, what France was giving to Niger. Um, according to Giorgio Maloney, the leader of Italy, they were ripping them off they were paying them 5% of the value of what that uranium is worth. And what Giorgio Maloney was saying is um, that, well, actually, uh, that, that figure, I don't know if that is from Giorgio Maloney, because I've heard that in two different places. For example, I don't know what the unit is, whether it's a, like an ounce or something. Say, say an ounce of uranium, and when the going price in the world is, uh, is like, uh, was it, uh, what they were quoting was uh, like two... Two hundred and fifteen dollars or something, and the, they were paying like Niger five dollars or something. That's that's just a that's kind of like a spit in the face. And what George Maloney said, at least, and I saw this in a speech, and she was very very passionate about this, which is very strange, you know, because she 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 loves Ukraine. I think she is very she she's practically in love with uh, with Zelensky. I don't know, but uh, so you, you would think that she would hate th these kind of exploiting people. And, you know, if, if she's she, she definitely is hearing about what 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 Zelensky is doing. I, I don't know. Maybe she's very gullible. She's very gullible to think that this guy's a great guy. But uh, anyway, as far as Niger is concerned, she's against this uh, invasion, a military invasion to deceit this uh, this coup government because she was talking about how France, she, she really has a hatred of Macron, I believe that's what it is. It's more like a hatred of Macron than anything else, but that's what a lot of people say, apparently. And uh, that she was saying that um, Niger, 90% of the country has no electricity, 90% of the people, I think. She's talking about the population. Whereas France gets most all their electricity you know, from the uranium that they take which is what they do. They take, they take this uranium from Niger while 90% of Niger has no electricity. So that, that's, that, putting it that way is... Uh, and uh, George Maloney, if you see some of her speeches, even if you don't uh, understand it, Italian, if you're just reading the, the subtitles, it's, it's very passionate. She's, very, she's actually very skilled at moving the people. The people. Very skilled, very skilled speaker. So you'd have to see that so yeah very passionate makes you uh, makes you actually I don't know you listen to her speeches and actually you say wow Georgia Maloney rock star rock star quality but then you find out how she supports uh, uh, Nazis you know that's that kind of wipes that away that kind of wipes that away right there doesn't hold any water. I guess she's just totally badly informed. You think about Donald Trump too, how badly informed he was. You know, he bombed uh, Soleimani and all the people that were around Soleimani. <clears throat> so, you know, what do you think? What do you think? A lot of people died. There's, some of these were, maybe all of them were innocent people and Donald Trump uh, had ordered that strike. So, uh, based on people lying to him. 
So remind me, I never want to run for a president of any country. You know, you're totally dependent on this information. It's, all, it's very odd, though, that you, Lukashenko, as far as I know, he doesn't really get such bad information. So why doesn't he make these terrible mistakes? I don't think Putin does either, does he? No, he doesn't. He made some slight mistakes, apparently, in this, in uh, um, the kicking off of this uh, special military operation. But, uh, but uh, it's not a big mistake like what Donald Trump did. So, anyway, I'm rambling again. I'm going to probably be cutting out most of this stuff in this video. But thanks for joining me. And uh, I'll see you on the next one whenever that's going to be. And thanks again. Bye-bye.